James Come, your half-assed reporter, and we are here at Life on Mars. I'm going to go in and talk to this artist, Paul D'Agostino, and the show is Chromatic Alphabet. Is that the title uh, of the show? No, it's called Scriptive Formalities. S scriptive Formalities. Yeah, scriptive Formalities. But it features <sighs> Chromatic Alphabets. It features chromatic al alphabets. Yeah. Let's go over here. I'm going to want to take a quick look. Okay. This is the actual, the whole alphabet, right? Yeah, that's the original version of the So we've got alphabet. A, that's a vowel. B, C, D. E is another vowel. Mm -hmm. F, G, H, I is another vowel. <laughs> J, K, L, M, N, O. P, Q, R, S, T, U. V, W, X, Y, and you said Y is a problem because sometimes it's a vowel, and Z. Yep, exactly. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, right? So, tell us, are you a structuralist or a post-structuralist when it comes to language? A structuralist or a post-structuralist? Well, here, I'm just a painter. So, <laughs> uh, I wanted to make a painting that had a word on it, and I wanted that word to not be readily apparent and so more like you want we're creating a code well yeah but i also wanted the letters to be determined in a rational enough way that i could keep using them so to make that painting that had that word i knew that i had to create the whole alphabet okay let's go over and look let's look at some of the paintings that you've uh, put together here Okay. Now, I came in and saw the show, and I hadn't read any of the uh, press previews or any of the explanations, and I was just looking at this and thinking, well, this is kind of nice, formalistic, almost like a uh, suprematist or a constructivist uh, composition, abstract composition, mm -hmm. but then you uh, sort of went in and decided that you wanted to have each one of these forms and shapes are vowels, consonants, Tell us about the uh, kind of the way that you distinguish. Well, in that initial 26 panels that we were just looking at, yes. um, that's the original alphabet that I created. And I took those 26 forms of vowels and consonants and I made a simplified alphabet. So this is the simplified chromatic alphabet here. Oh, okay. Uh, and the reason I made a simplified alphabet is to not have to recreate all of the different complexities that I put into those initial panels so that uh, I would have all the information in one place. Those initial panels have all the information that I sifted through. And so each one of these paintings is a, a word, is a... Yeah, any painting that has more than one letter is a word. Okay, so, so tell us what this one says. Uh, this one says couleur. Says what? Couleur. Couleur, couleur. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. Um, and the reason I made this painting in French is because it, in thinking through the different words for colors, in the languages that I know. Uh, French was the only language where the word colors in the plural would also feature all of the colors. Okay, you're actually also an Italian scholar, isn't that true? Yeah. So language is very important to you. Yeah. You know what, we're gonna drift around the corner here and I wanted to look at this uh, series as well. Uh -huh. Now, here again you've got these basic 
circular forms, but you've sort of gone in and uh, and divided them. Tell us. Well, all of the 12 by 12s in this show, yes. so including all these here, uh, are letters that feature diacritic marks. Diacritic marks. Right, like accent marks, circumflexes, umlauts. We don't have a lot of those in English, at least no, not American we English. English. We don't, but again, I wanted to establish a system of letters that I could continue using to make words on paintings. So I knew that I would need letters with diacritics. How about just the, the aspect of, of the straight painting side of it, you know, the selecting the colors, uh, how you combine, uh, say, the, the primary colors with the grays, uh -huh. things like that. What, what were you thinking about with well, those? Well, really all the choices that I make with these more or less come from the initial alphabet that I created. So okay. gray in the alphabet, because gray is used for consonants, represents closure. Uh, closure of a vowel or the cutting off of sound. Um, and the gray that I use is all of the primary colors mixed with white. So the gray itself comes from the colors. It has meaning within the system as an indication of closure, but it also comes from the colors. Well, I guess my next question is, being a painter, um, how important is it for you that the people that are looking at these are aware of the textual or the uh, it's not. the alphabet part of them? Because I'm thinking, you know, like I said, they struck me as just kind of nice, formalistic, abstract paintings. Well, that's good, because I hope that they have that impact as well. I it's guess what I'm saying is, was the was the creation of the alphabet the driving impulse of the uh, the exhibition, or was it just a an excuse or a reason to kind of get in and make yourself some nice uh, well abstract I mean, paintings? I I couldn't have made these paintings without the idea of creating an alphabet to make a painting with words. Um, in fact, that was the painting that started it all. I wanted to this make, one. <laughs> well, basically, but I had to I had to work through the alphabet before I could ever make this painting. So I wanted to make a painting that had the word quadro on it because in Italian quadro. Right. In Italian quadro means square, but it's also one of the words that you can use to refer to a painting. So really? I wanted to make a painting on a square canvas that said the word quadro written in a rectangle. I thought, wouldn't that be clever? But not really, because it would kind of be a one-liner. So I thought, well, if I could make that painting that said the word quadro on a square canvas, but it weren't readily apparent that it had a word on it, then that could be interesting. So I knew that if I wanted to get those six letters that I would need to make the painting, I would have to make the whole alphabet. And that's how I started the rabbit hole. Uh, so I had to make the whole alphabet, and then in making the whole alphabet, and when I started making paintings with words, I realized, well, some of the words that I'm going to want to write are going to feature letters with diacritic marks, so I would need to make an N with a tilde, and I would need to make a U with a, an acute accent, and I would need to make an O with a grave accent, and... Uh, that's how I just kept working through these things. Okay, tell us now, we're going to ask you about the painterly side of things. These are actually acrylic with a little oil and... Uh-huh, uh yeah, so a lot of gesso. Okay, so that's what you build up your ground with the gesso. Yeah, it's a, it's a few layers of gesso and then a few layers of acrylic and then a couple more layers of gesso and then acrylic and oil on top. And you said you did that because you, you like the way that the oil paint sort of sits on top there and it... Well, the oil, especially for the, you know, the valves or anything, anything that's color on any of these paintings, it's basically representative of the part of speech that is sound. And so oil gives you that greater reflectivity. It, it makes things a little more rich. So in a way, it conveys something along the lines of the material interpretation of sound to some extent. Really? Okay, let's go around. We're going to uh, 
well, more wrap than, up more, looking more at this wall. So you're so sensitive to the relating the uh, the surfaces to the sounds. Well, that's that's why all the layers, like the layers of color that are underneath the top layers of gesso, are are the primary colors. And since the alphabet is ranged through the primary colors, then the embedded primary colors behind the letter or behind the word kind of come forth through the painting and have this element of transparency and, and mutability and changeability that language itself has. Now, what would you say to people that would say um, the reason that they like painting is because it kind of gets away from the part of the brain that is dealing with letters and language that uh, somehow uh, there is a social ideology of some kind that is sort of placed on language and letters and alphabets, whereas in a purely, especially an abstract visual form, that uh, constraint is not there? Uh, I'd say I think about things differently. So you like the idea of having some kind of guiding rules or some principles that you can work with as you start getting more creative, maybe? Yeah. Um, I like to find systems in which I can make things or sort of reasons for which I start to make forms. Would you consider these conceptual paintings? Yeah, I suppose so. Okay. I suppose so. Well, Paul D'Agostino, tell me the title of the show again. Uh, ma ora facciamo in italiano il titolo dell'esibizione Formalità scrittive. E l'esibizione dura fino a che marzo? We are live on Mars. Okay. Vita su Marte. I hope you're not getting in any obscenity there that no, I can't understand. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Ma ora qui abbiamo anche. Okay. We're going to wrap this up, and here's Art Guerrera. Thanks okay. again, Paul, here at Life on Mars. So we, at this point, we always say thank you, Kate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.